One of the requests I get quite a bit is regarding the OSI reference model, how it works and what the pieces are. This story is to help give you an analogy of what the various roles are in each of the layers of the OSI reference model so you can master it. Enjoy. This analogy is going to help us understand and really internalize the OSI reference model. So before we go to that, the OSI reference model, let's talk about something that we all know from books or possibly in the municipalities that we live in. We have two kings. I have King A and King B. On the top, in fact, the top row up here is all of King, B, King A's departments and all of his people. And let's talk about what happens when King A would like to invite King B to lunch. King A says to himself, I think I'd like to invite King B to lunch. So what he does, he calls for his scribe. Now the scribe comes in, yes, what can I do for you? What service can I provide for you? And the king says, I need to, to have a message sent. And the scribe says, no problem, what is it? And King A says, I'd like to invite King B to lunch. It's been a long time since we've seen him. And I was wondering if he could come over for a grand event sometime in, you know, the next moon or whatever it is, the next month and with a date. So the scribe writes everything down verbatim from the king. Then the scribe says this, well, gee, I'm the scribe. There's no way in heck that I'm going to have to go out on my horse and deliver this information all the way over to Kingdom B to deliver to that side. There are rules in place, a protocol, if you will, that's in place. And the protocol that the scribe follows is take any messages you get from the king and then you give them to the translator. The translator's job, you guessed it, is to translate. Perhaps King B speaks French and King A speaks English. The translator's job might be to translate that message to the correct format, if you will. Its job also might be the translators would be to maybe do some encryption or decryption, meaning to keep the message safe and secret while it's in transit. In this case, it's just a simple message that's being sent. There is no requirement for encryption or translation because they both speak English. And as a result, the translator says, gee, easy job for me today. I'm still on the payroll, nothing to do. The protocol says I need to hand this message over to the negotiator. And the translator also might note that there's nothing for me to do and add his two cents to the packet or to the message and hand it to the negotiator. Now, the negotiator, what does he have? He's got this message from King A. And the message is an invitation to King B for lunch. So the negotiator says, well, let's see here. Maybe, yeah, that'll work. It's a good idea to have lunch with King B, to build a relationship, a bond, and so forth. And he says, I think it's a good idea Let's go ahead and allow this to happen. The negotiator is like a counselor, if you will, to the king as far as what should and shouldn't happen. So the negotiator says, yep, it's okay. We'll let this message go. And that is the executive team, by the way. The negotiator, the translator, and the scribe are all the, the senior level management, if you will, in Kingdom A. Now, unfortunately, somebody has to do the work. So this message now gets handed down to the middle manager who's worried. He's just worried in general, you know, with cutbacks in the kingdom and everything else. So he's nervous about getting this message over to the far side. So what he's going to do is this. He's going to say, well, the message is pretty big because it was an invite from for lunch plus some other personal details. He says, I don't want to lose the whole thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this message that was generated by the king, written by the scribe, translated if necessary by the translator, and the negotiator said, yes, it's okay, let's do it. The middle manager is going to take that message, if you want, and cut it up into maybe two parts. He'll cut it up into two parts, and he'll call it part one of two and part two of two. And he is going to hopefully get a message from the other side, from the other kingdom, saying that they got both pieces. So he marks them one of two and two of two, and he stands nervously by waiting for an acknowledgement that those actually were sent correctly. So then the protocol or the rule in this kingdom is to go ahead and take those messages, part one of two and two of two, and hand them to the mailroom. Now, everybody knows what a mailroom does. They send and receive mail. So somebody in the mailroom says, oh, these need to go to Kingdom B. And I know the address for Kingdom B. So somebody in the mailroom creates two labels. Why? Well, one label for... Part, you know, piece one of two and the second label for two of two. And he 
puts those labels on the appropriate um, or creates the labels and then has to make a decision. Ooh, which uh, carrier are we going to use? Are we going to use FedEx and, or UPS? And that is a very interesting predicament in a kingdom where maybe we didn't even – we were using horses previously, but they've been upgraded. Now there's FedEx and UPS. And so we decide on the appropriate envelope to use. If we're going FedEx, we use a FedEx envelope. If we're going UPS, we use a UPS envelope. And we put those labels on those envelopes. And then we put it on the truck. Now, we have two packages now. We have one of two and two of two that the middle manager stamped on or put his you know tag on. We have the actual addresses involved that the mailroom put on. We have them in envelopes, and now they go on the truck. Now, the truck is going to deliver that over to the correct kingdom. Now, this road represented right here, you know, that could be a half a world away. It could be the next kingdom. It could be a couple countries away. It could be five miles away. It depends on, you know, the geography involved. So we might use local area network or wide area network services for that. But in this story, we're just going to say that the delivery system routed the packet correctly and the packet ended up on the doorstep of Kingdom B's mailroom. Well, they took it, these two packages, and they said, well, let's open up the envelope and take a look. So they opened up the envelope, handed it to the mailroom, who said, yep, this is for us. These packages are for us, and my job, says the protocol, is to hand it over to the middle manager. So the middle manager gets one of two, and he sees the information that this middle manager put on it, the one of two, and he gets nervous. He goes, oh, no. One of two, that means there's two of two. Where is it? Where is it? He takes a deep breath. Two of two finally arrives a few seconds later, and the middle manager takes those, puts them together into the original message, and hands them up to the, sh the schmoozer or the negotiator on the receiving side. And the, the negotiator says, wait, let's see here. Are we in good speaking terms with Kingdom A? Do we want to allow this message to come in? If the answer is yes, the middle manager or the negotiator takes the message and hands it to the translator. Now, the translator on the receiving side, if there was encryption or translation or any kind of uh, functionality that he would normally do, he would do it. In this case, it's in English. We speak English. No problem. There's no encryption, so he doesn't need to decrypt anything. So his job in life is easy. He's still on the payroll. He hands it to the scribe. The scribe takes the message, knocks on the door of the King B's headquarters, his office, and says, King A would like to know if you want to have lunch. What we've just done is we've gone through a set of rules in these two fictitious kingdoms of how traffic or how communication happens. The top three layers, the negotiator, the translator, and the scribe, those are the executive team <laughs> that make up. They don't do a lot of work, but they actually decide on what's going to happen. And then we have the middle manager and down. They are actually responsible for making sure that message gets delivered and delivered successfully. This, by the way, is an analogy of the OSI reference model. The purpose of having standards, for example, of who talks to what and how it, how it happens, isn't because that's physically how it happens. We couldn't get a microscope and say, yep, he's handed it to him and he's handed it to him. But by setting up a logical framework of responsibilities and departments, two different vendors can build a product that is compatible with the other because they're both following the same sets of rules and they're both compliant with those rules or protocols. And that's one of the benefits of the OSI reference model. Now that we've taken a look at this analogy, let's take a look at the literal model itself and apply the concepts that we've learned here to the actual OSI model.